Um, but first, I would just like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt, and the Wasanich peoples, whose relationship with the land continues to this day. I'm so pleased that so many could, of you could get out today. Um, the Harvey Southern Lectureship is named after a uh, UVic alumnus and journalist, and it's made possible f by a gift from one of Canada's leading publishing families. Um, every year we bring a national or internationally known journalist, Canadian journalist, to come and work with our students and also to give a lecture on their area of expertise uh, to the general public. And today we're really honored to have Erica Guise with us. Um, she's a National Geographic Explorer. She's winner of the Rachel Carson Award for Excellence in Environmental Journalism. And we're gonna hear a bit about what her work has to say about the fascinating complexity of water, and especially in these times of drought, fire, and flood. Um, her reporting has appeared in Scientific American, Hakai, uh, The Narwhal, The New York Times, the journal Nature, The Guardian, and many other publications. And in her book, uh, Water Always Wins, which is also the title of her talk today, she says that if water were a category in a game of rock, paper, scissors, water would beat them all every time. And given what we've experienced here in BC, the another record year of drought, and of course, another record fire season, it's sort of strange that fire has become a season right now. And now we're all wondering what's gonna happen with, uh, with the floods, um, hoping we don't see a repeat of the one two years ago. It really couldn't be a better time to hear uh, what she has to say. There's gonna be time for questions afterward. There will be books also for sale from Uvic Bookstore at the back. Um, but in the meantime, please join me in welcoming Erica Geis. I'm really happy to be here and thank you to Deborah Campbell and to the writing department at UVic and the Southam family uh, for this honor. So why water? Um, I grew up in California where water is a long time preoccupation of just about everyone. Um, and when I started reporting on water as a journalist, I just found that it was more and more fascinating. Like everything I learned about it was like all the things that it gets up to are just kind of mind blowing. And I think today more and more people are realizing um, how important it is, particularly as we have um, increasingly severe and frequent floods and droughts. So reporting my book, Water Always Wins, I got to talk with a lot of experts. And what I learned in a nutshell is that it's time for the dominant culture to change our relationship with water. You know, we tend to think of water in the dominant culture as either a commodity or a threat. And that leads to an instinct to try to control it. But not all humans think that way. So for my book research, I traveled to Washington State, uh, California, China, Iraq, Peru, Kenya, England, India. And in all these places, I found people who are innovating new ways to work with water, and in some cases, very old ways to reduce drought and flood. So this picture is a woman um, who is Madan. She is a marsh dweller. She lives on the Mesopotamian marshes of Iraq. And the folks there have a very different relationship with water than our own. Um, they have a 9,000-year-old culture of living with water. It was thought to be the, the Garden of Eden in the Bible. Um, the Sumerian culture arose out of the marsh dwellers after 3,000 years. And to the marsh dwellers, water truly is life. <coughs> so they build islands out of reeds. Um, they raise water buffalo who swim around and graze. Uh, and they harvest cheese and milk from them. Um, they also fish. And they trade with people on dry land for vegetables. They also eat some of the reed material. Um, they get around their water world in these mashus, which are a long, narrow canoe. 
Phragmites australis, which is sort of a scourge in a lot of places, an invasive weed is actually native to the marshes. It's an incredibly fast growing renewable resource and they use it for building. This house on the right, uh, you know, tarp notwithstanding <laughs> is in the style that they have built for 9,000 years, sort of a, a Kwanzaa hut shape. Um, and they have experienced a lot of different threats to their way of life over the years, including during the reign of Saddam Hussein, who built levees and drained the marshes because um, some of the people who were against him were hiding out. So it was a retaliatory measure. And a lot of the folks who had lived here um, forever had to go to Babylon and Baghdad and live on land for the first time. But when Saddam fell, they immediately returned to the marshes. They busted holes in their levees. The water came back and they resumed their way of life. And in general, in the 9,000 years they've been on this wetland, many, many storied irrigated civilizations have risen and fallen. And the water has then returned to the marshes. This is a Modif. It's their community center. It's also built out of Phragmites. Um, but an ongoing threat to this civilization are big upstream dams in Turkey and Iran. Um, they're holding back a lot of the water and really dewatering the marshes to a large degree. But what I really took away from the Madan is that the longevity of their culture really pales in comparison to our own. And the way that they relate to water, I think, is a significant part of it. So it's a fact that climate change is really bringing these water extremes to people where they live all over the world. For every degree Celsius warming, the atmosphere can hold 7% more water, which is why we're seeing these really torrential rains and also really severe droughts, which are caused by a thirstier atmosphere that can hold more water before it hits that um, tipping point into rain. So these trends were predicted by climate scientists decades ago, and we are now seeing them coming to pass. So in the dominant culture, humans often respond to floods and droughts by calling for more control. <coughs> Higher levees, bigger drains, longer aqueducts. But a really important point that a lot of people are not realizing is that it's not just climate change causing these disasters. It's also our development choices. It's urban sprawl, industrial agriculture and forestry, and the concrete infrastructure that we use to try to control water. This concrete infrastructure is brittle, and it's failing increasingly often, which forces us to face that eternal truth that sooner or later, water always wins. So the dominant European North American mindset which has been exported around the world via colonialism and capitalism is really centered on the human as most important and separate from nature. So it leads to this single focus problem solving. You know, we're worried about flooding, we build a levee. We need water, we build the dam, we bring it from somewhere else. But putting ourselves first in this way isn't working. In attempting to try to control water, we ignore its agency and its relationships with underground geology, microbes, beavers, and ourselves. And therefore, we undermine these complex systems that support us. And that is how our development and our infrastructure is exacerbating both flood and water scarcity. So when I say that we've interfered with the water cycle to a really extreme extent, um, this is what I mean. We've actually filled or drained up to 87% of the world's wetlands. We've dammed and diverted two-thirds of the world's large rivers. Just since 1992, the land area covered by pavements with our cities has doubled. Also since 1992, incidentally the year when a really good data set began, <laughs> um, the areas of floodplains that we have encroached is larger um, than the area of Ukraine. So instead of trying to solve one problem at a time, the water detectives I met all around the world, these are engineers, ecologists, landscape architects, farmers, urban planners, they're instead asking a radical question. They're asking, what does water want? So what I've come to understand 
is that what water wants is a return of its slow phases that are particularly prone to our development. So it's wetlands, floodplains, water towers, forests, meadows. And they are all part of this global movement that I call slow water. Um, so like the slow food movement, each solution is unique to its place. It seeks to work with local geology, ecology, and culture. Um, it involves systems thinking rather than single focus problem solving. These are distributed across the landscape rather than centralized. Slow water is ideally local, helping us to live within local water cycle and availability. And that is important because water issues are also social justice issues. <clears throat> you know, if you build a levee in one area and you protect one community, you're raising the water level in the river and you're increasing risk for another community who perhaps can't afford a levee. Similarly, dams have brought water to 20% of the world's population but decreased water availability to 24% of the world's population. And even the people who seem lucky, the, the beneficiaries of this infrastructure, they are also more at risk. There's something called the levee effect, which is that false sense of security that people get when there's a levee and they think that the area won't flood. And so increasing housing and businesses move into that area. And then when it does flood, um, you have more people who are at risk. Similarly, um, there's a reservoir effect with um, people who get uh, additional water from a dam, for example. And socio-hydrologists, people who work at the intersection of people and water, have found that again and again and again, when you bring water from a different area, you only increase demand. You attract more housing, more farming, more development, and then you repeat the cycle of scarcity, and you have more people who are vulnerable to water scarcity in that area. So slow water is also community facing. So in some of the places I went, the community was actively managing the landscape and the slow water in their areas. It's a little hard to imagine that in North America, but um, sometimes there's an educational component where maybe um, you know an area in a floodplain industry has left. It's been restored to a wetland or a parkland so that the community can engage with it and it can serve as extra space for water when the waters rise. And maybe there are signage there explaining to people you know, what this landscape is doing and what water is doing in this area. So when you have solutions that are distributed across the landscape, you're gonna have a lot of people coming into contact with them. And so that's an opportunity for that education. So slow water projects start with historical ecology. This is the Duwamish Valley in South Seattle. Um, and this is very typical of urban development all around the world, um, where streams and rivers are straightened, um, paved over, wetlands are filled in. And so the point of doing this research of understanding what water did in our area before we subverted it is because water has a tendency to go where it wants to go. And so you know, we often see that homes built on wetlands are the first to flood. So if we understand where the water went, we have a good understanding of where it might go. And that allows our communities to make long-term plans. So, you know, there is actually a lot of turnover in buildings over time. So if you have a 50 or 100 year plan that recognizes that an area is a wetland or a stream, <clears throat> maybe you would decide not to uh, authorize another building, but to take that space for water. So what happens when we ignore what water wants? This is a photo of Fraser Valley in November 2021. Um, and 100 years ago, this land was reclaimed from Four Rivers and Samath Lake. And historically, the Samath and Stolo people relied on this lake for most of their food. And they moved with it as it ebbed and expanded through the seasons from 14 square miles to 47 square miles. This was a large lake. So how are the cities, the province, and the feds responding to this disaster? Canada is a signatory to the International Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And what that does is it outlines disasters as an as a opportunity to rethink business as usual. Um, so there has been a lot of talk about building back better. 
Uh, but mostly it's been rebuilding the same. It's an opportunity squandered. Canada is also a signatory on the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, in which the provincial and federal governments are obligated to incorporate indigenous views into co-governance, not just listening, but co-governing. Um, and the settlers and indigenous people here have significantly different worldviews. So again, the standard Eurocentric view, uh, the goals are never-ending growth, um, extractive wealth. So water in that sense is a commodity or a threat. It spawns this urge to control it. Indigenous cultures, not just here in Canada, but around the world, see water as a who, a relative or a friend, just as they say salmon are their relations. So with that view comes not just rights, but responsibility. It's a, a relationship of give and take, and it engenders caretaking and systems thinking. So Samath and Stolo people I spoke to for this story, which appeared in the Narwhal, understand the pain of displacement. So they're not necessarily <laughs> saying return the lake, um, but they would like to see more room for water and salmon in the way that we respond to this disaster, not taller levees, not additional pumps, as has also been proposed. Um, there's also a financial calculation. Uh, there was a UBC study that found that buying out landowners and moving homes and businesses and farms to higher ground and allowing Samath Lake to reflood would cost about $3 billion, compared with $4.5 billion to maintain the status quo just through 2050. And the Build Back initiative is already expected to cost more than $9 billion. This area is going to flood again. So the question is when, and are we going to still have all of that stuff in, in its path? There are different ways to approach it. Um, just across the border in Washington state, there's a river that also leads to the Fraser Valley um, called the Nooksack. And during the 2021 uh, storm, it jumped its bank and flowed downhill into Abbotsford. So some people in Canada were like, hey, Washington, build us a, you know, build a levee. <laughs> what are you thinking? And I spoke with Whatcom County's river and flood engineering manager, a woman named Paula Harris, who would make that de decision. And she said, when you divert water from one flow path to another, you're choosing, you own the increased damages in that other area. You're making a conscious decision to flood other people worse. So instead, Washington has a 20 year history of something called floodplain integrated planning, uh, in which they've come together with farmers, indigenous people, um, water managers to try to come to some kind of consensus. And it follows the 10 golden rules of floodplain management, number one, is accepting that it's impossible to prevent all flooding. Number two is to promote some flooding as desirable. And that's because if people don't give water enough room, it's going to take it by force. So it's better to plan ahead and figure out where people can best tolerate it. Washington's floodplain integrated planning had already set back some levees in areas where houses had been washed away in previous floods, giving the river there more access to its floodplains. So during the 2021 floods, these projects worked as intended, slowing the water and protecting people in that area from flooding. So all of the slow water projects I looked at around the world focus on this connection between surface water and groundwater. And you know, in a lot of places, people have overexploited groundwater. Um, people sometimes in really dry areas think of groundwater as extra water. Um, but in fact, groundwater and surface water are the same water. They are linked by gravity and hydraulic pressure. So when you decrease groundwater, you also decrease surface water. And we've also erased a lot of these slow phases that would naturally replenish water. When water slows, it can then move underground and refill the groundwater. Um, and historically, in the West, a lot of streams ran year round because they were supplied by this healthy groundwater. Uh, same with wetlands. So 
This is a big concern um, on the Gulf Islands, certainly, and also rural places around BC, like Machosan, where people are dependent on groundwater and they've seen those levels fall. So population growth and climate change are definitely factors, but another is the way in which we have dramatically altered land. So this picture is from Maine Island which has almost none of its historical wetlands. Um, they are 70 to 90% eradicated, according to <coughs> estimates from the Maine Island Conservancy. They've been largely drained and converted to agricultural land like this. Um, so Peter Robinson and his wife, Christine Weber, retired to this farm, hedgerow farm, to farm hay. <coughs> and this particular land was actually once one of the largest wetlands on Maine Island. Uh, but it has been without water for about a century. Today, it looks like this. This is about four years of work. So with the help of the Conservancy, they restored this 25-acre wetland, which is about one-sixth of the total area of their property. Um, water is now on the land in this area year-round. They have amazing bird life, uh, bats, etc. And they did it largely with this small weir. They planted some native plants. They put up a fence to keep the deer from munching them. <clears throat> and uh, the field right next to this wetland, he told me, used to be the worst. He could barely grow any hay. Now it's his best. And he does not irrigate. It's because the plant can access the water because the groundwater table is higher. So I saw and heard um, similar results from an alfalfa farmer in Northern California who was slowing water on his property to reduce his need for irrigation. Um, in terms of the wider impacts of this particular project on the Maine Island community, I know other people on Maine have issues with um, their wells uh, falling lower. I don't really know because it's a pretty new project and there hasn't really been um, scientific analysis yet, but um, I believe that is coming, so stay tuned. Um, so what can you do if you don't have 144 acres? Lawns are the largest irrigated crop in North America. Um, lawns are an ecological desert. They are a monoculture. Um, they require fertilizers and pesticides that run off and pollute our water. Um, and. Uh, so this picture on the left is Malia Acker's house. She's here. <laughs> um, she's a postdoctoral researcher in UVic's geography department. And she started con converting her suburban yard to native plants in 2011. You can see all the camas popping up there. So uh, a native plant, and I've, I've also done this at, at my place, native plant gardens don't require any supplemental water. They don't require chemical fertilizers. Um, <clears throat> and why, why are we so hung up on lawns anyway? As Malia has written, um, lawns are a nostalgic memorial to England's arist aristocratic estates. And they disconnect us from what is actually here. Moss, licorice, fern, fairy cup lichen. She says, it's time to live in the place where we are. And I've seen this in a lot of places, like Phoenix, for example, which used to have a lot of lawns and now is really embracing saguaros and Palo Verde trees. You know, there is that pride of place that we can connect with when we get to know our, our native plants. And they also create really important habitat for local critters. So on the right, this is uh, an, an urban solution. Um, my screen is popping up and down. Um, so as I said, globally, urban expanse has doubled just since 1992, and urban flooding has increased in line with that. Um, and also water scarcity, because cities respond to urban flooding by whisking that water away, and then when the dry season comes, they don't have it, and they try to get it from somewhere else. So rain gardens or bioswales like this one um, in East Vancouver uh, can definitely help. But if you think of the scale of that pavement, um, and the, the size of a city, you understand why we need infiltration areas like this all throughout our cities. <clears throat> it's a question of trying to get near to that scale um, that we have eradicated with our development. 
Uh, but every little bit helps, and these projects are scalable. So um, I looked at another project, um, which I may not have time to talk about today in Seattle, but they did their historical ecology research. They found these areas that were flooding all the time. And in an 11 mile long stream, they restored just 1,600 feet. Uh, but because they had done their homework and they had discovered it was these floodplains, they have eliminated the flooding problem that they had in that area. Um, so it's important to also be thoughtful and for our policies to um, make this kind of thing possible and not be a roadblock to doing so. Um, so climate is affecting water with increased floods and droughts, but water and biology are also affecting climate, which is something we don't hear as much about. <clears throat> Water phase change from solid to liquid to gas is the primary way that Earth releases heat. And healthy ecosystems with a balanced water cycle buffer water extremes locally, regionally, and globally, which help to keep the climate stable. Sickened, damaged ecosystems don't do this nearly as well. Forests play a key role in the global water cycle. Their roots help water move underground and also provide rain because they tap ground <laughs> tap groundwater, lift it up, and then release it into the air as vapor, uh, a kind of exhalation called transpiration, which can then form rain. So when it condenses into rain, it falls again locally and regionally, and this phenomenon is sometimes called precipitation recycling. And scientists used to think that most rain came from evaporation of the oceans, but more recently they've found that evapor evapotranspiration from soil and plants are actually the source of 10 to 80 percent of rain over continents, depending on where you're located. Forest exhalations also feed into jet streams and atmospheric circulations, seeding rain on the other side of the world. Atmospheric scientist and ecologist Abigail Swan at the University of Washington calls this phenomenon eco-climate teleconnections. So on the flip side, forest loss can decrease rain at each of these levels, uh, locally, regionally, and globally. A healthy, connected forest performs these water regulations best, according to novel research by a Russian atmosphere physicist named Anastasia Makareva. <coughs> People used to think that temperature differences between the ocean and land were the primary thing pulling water vapor over trees. And the idea was that trees grew where it rained. But her biotic pump theory found that forests don't just grow where it rains, they actively pull in the rain that they need. So she documented this phenomenon. Basically, when the water vapor is exhaled in a big blanket of trees, um, it rises, uh, turns, condenses into clouds and rain, and the local air pressure decreases, which then pulls in more wind to keep pushing that rain inland. This idea is not radical, she told me. All organisms possess knowledge of physical laws that allow them to make use of the environment. We're not surprised when birds build nests. So when it comes to forests, this summer was really apocalyptic across Canada, as more than 43 million acres of forests burned, according to research from McMaster University. Um, also this summer, I visited Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California. That's where this picture was taken, which is a place that's very special to my family. I've been going there my whole life. <clears throat> and 60% of it burned two years ago in the Dixie Fire. Fires are a natural part of some ecosystems, but certainly there is sadness in looking at a beloved landscape and knowing that it will never be the same in my lifetime. Nevertheless, I was really um, in interested to see the dramatic difference between the national park and the commercial forests that are just outside the national park, which was a completely dead hellscape. <laughs> the park, on the other hand, was showing a ton of regrowth in the understory. Here you can see it was a very good year for lupin. And not all the trees burned, and not all the trees that burned were dead, and new trees were sprouting. My partner and I saw several burned trees that were oozing this blood red sap. Um, so the conventional wisdom about forest management is that protected forests, i.e. 
that aren't logged have a fuel loading problem and increased fire severity. But newer research disputes that. A study of 1,500 fires in the Western United States over 30 years <clears throat> found that protected forests, in fact, had decreased fire severity. In areas with more intense management, i.e. logging, had higher burn severities. Other research supports this finding. In fact, industrial logging makes fires worse because the landscape is much drier than it is in natural forests. So evapotranspiration is reduced because those really big trees are great at exhaling a ton of water. Um, and the land is hotter without shade, and it's hotter without the evapotranspiration, which is a cooling process in and of itself. They've removed the understory plants and the decomposing wood that creates this kind of spongy, moist environment and expose the soil to drying. So this is Lassen again, um, showing that really robust small plant recovery. And you can see there are some live trees among the dead ones there. And this area was just buzzing with insects and birds. So intact, healthy ecosystems help to balance water and, cl and climate extremes because they evolve together, according to that Russian scientist, Makareva. Indigenous prescribe burning as part of that process. But reducing primary forests with plantations of one or two commercial species or keeping forests in an early successional state in order to maximize short-term timber revenues disrupts that natural community's evolved ability to regulate the water cycle and the climate conditions. Plus, the logging industry often uses pesticides to kill non-commercial deciduous species, which are also less likely to burn and that kills organic matter in the soil. <clears throat> and soil with more organic matter can hold orders of magnitude more water. So that means more moist environment, it means less runoff and landslides, it means more water available for those plants as well. So she told me the most important thing people can do to protect their communities is to protect old growth forests and connected vegetated lands. St simply stopping their ongoing destruction will slow down climate destabilization, she told me. So switching gears to another slow water practitioner, the famous Canadian, the beaver. So when settlers came to North America, they trapped and killed mo most beavers, which radically altered the plumbing of North America. <clears throat> Before, about one-tenth of the continent were beaver-created wetlands. The groundwater table was high. So people often think of beavers as causing floods because they build dams and that slows water. Um, but in fact, in the UK, people are using beavers to prevent floods. <coughs> so a different species of beaver is native to Europe and to the United Kingdom, but um, in the UK, they have been completely gone, um, extirpated for 400 years. More recently, people have been reintroducing them and welcoming them back. Because with increased rain from climate change, a lot of villages built right along streams have been flooding. And we've seen this in other places too, like that really devastating flooding that was in Germany, uh, I think last year. So basically what the beavers do is they slow the peak flow. The water is still moving through their dam, but more slowly and over a longer period of time. So you have a lowered flood peak and lowered risk of flooding. And so some scientists there have studied that peak flows um, downstream of beaver dams were 30% lower on average than in streams without dams. And these effects held true even in really saturated midwinter conditions. And during the dry season, when the stream would completely dry up, running into the beaver complex, it continued flowing on the other side of it because of the groundwater storage. This little poster is from California in the mid 20th century. Um, and in the Western US, people have been embracing beavers for their ability to mitigate droughts. Um, so in the earlier part of the century, 1920s through the 1950s, people were relocating beavers from areas where they were causing problems with people and moving them into remote areas where they could heal streams. And they understood at that point that 
beavers did a lot to heal a, a sick stream system. And the parachute is because in Idaho and California, people actually did parachute beavers into really remote areas without roads. At, at first, um, they were trying to bring them in on, on horses and mules, but the, the animals didn't like that. They didn't like something moving around in there. Um, so they tried parachuting them in and, and had a lot of success with that. So in the 1990s, Washington State started reintroducing beavers to different places and taking a much more hands-on approach. A lot of other western states have followed suit, most recently California, which now has five state-level staff positions for beaver management and reintroductions. And until very recently, um, a lot of people would still kill beavers when they found them on their property. I mean, it does still happen today. Um, but yeah, there's this thought of it's going to cause problems for us, so let's get rid of them. But as one uh, beaver relocator told me, if you have beavers now, you're going to have beavers again. Because the reason you have beavers now is because you have great habitat for beavers. And if you kill these beavers, other beavers are going to come along and say, oh, hey, this looks like a great home, so we'll move right in. Um, but they can have really... Um, really great impacts for water, particularly in a time when we think about the, all the ways in which we've dramatically dried out the West, killing beavers, cutting forests, overgrazing grasslands, putting our rivers behind levees and draining all the wetlands. So beavers help to restore some of that water on the land. And one researcher found that the beavers he relocated in the first year, they stored 75 times more water above and below ground per 100 meters of streams than area without beavers. And so like in California, for example, like 30% of the water that people use is stored in the snowpack on the Sierras. But the snow is melting. That snowpack is predicted to be 80% gone by 2100. So, you know, there's a lot of space to store water underground because we've pumped out so much and the beavers can really help with that, which is a big part of why California is now embracing beavers again. In rain-dominated water basins, beaver ponds increase summer water availability by 20%. And there's a researcher in Southern California who's done a lot of work around beavers and fires. <coughs> she uh, published this one uh, scientific paper called Smokey the Beaver. And basically, you know, water doesn't burn. And when you allow beavers to return in the way they want, which is scattered all down a watershed, they create a, a big fire break. And in one part of Washington state, there's already been an example of that and uh, proof that it, it helped <laughs> with the fire. Um, but the benefits extend beyond the pond itself because they're raising the water table and making that water available to plants. So the plants are a lot less dried out and less likely to burn. Um, beavers are still at only about 10% of historical numbers across North America. So um, it, it's interesting. Like some people really love beavers, and I definitely encounter people who are still very much of the they're causing problems for us mindset. But you know, it's really our, we have moved into beaver territory. Humans and beavers both like kind of low flatlands. And our infrastructure, you know, we put a stream into a, a tiny pipe. <laughs> um, so it's, it's not compatible with what they do. But what they do um, brings a lot of benefits. So one way to deal with that is to expect beavers. We have those, all those signs, expect deer. We should also expect beavers. And there's a lot of ways that we can design our infrastructure that can benefit when beavers come in as opposed to causing problems. Um, so if we can find ways to live with them, uh, we'll be much better off. So we have a few minutes, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Seattle project that I had mentioned earlier. And it's just, I like this story because it shows how much more complex water is than we give it credit for. So all across the developed world, we have buried most streams. 75% um, seems to be a, a good average. And streams that remain on the surface often look like this. They have had their riparian, the plants all along them, cut. 
they've been straightened, they've been armored. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's all a process of those single focus problem solving, right? First you cut the trees, then the water starts running off faster. You're worried about flooding, so you straighten it. That causes fast water, sort of a fire hose that causes massive erosion, and you're worried about the erosion, so then you put in sandbags or, or concrete to anchor it. And ecologists call this urban stream syndrome. And it's really marked by flash floods, unstable, unstable banks, a lot of pollution, and almost no life. Um, so in Seattle, there's a creek called Thornton Creek. It runs 11 miles through a very urban area with about 70,000 people. Um, and it was flooding a school, a road, and people's homes regularly. So they wanted to do something about it. Um, over a period of about 20 years, the city bought out homes from willing sellers, people who kept flooding, to make a little more um, horizontal space because their homes were literally hanging over the creek. Um, and they planned to kind of restore the natural S-curves, remove the concrete, plant some plants, put in some wood and rock. Um, in Seattle, where they have salmon, like here, any creek project needs to also think about salmon. What are we going to do for the salmon? So the rocks and trees were sort of to make it habitat -y. Um But what restorationists have realized is that these kinds of solutions don't actually work. They don't reduce flooding. They require a lot of ongoing maintenance. They don't attract more life. Um, it's sort of like a uh, crows and cockroaches situation in terms of who is actually able to live in even a restored creek. So one person who worked for the city, Catherine Lynch, who is a biologist, realized, you know, it's not just the stream we see. It's also the stream that we don't see underground. So we talked earlier about the surface water and the groundwater, but there's also this liminal space in between an ecotone called the hyperreic zone, hypo under reic flow. Um, and all kinds of critical things happen in there with nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon cycling, food creation. Um, there's microbes, crustaceans, worms, aquatic insects who live there. And it's sort of like the stream's gut microbiome. So, you know, we've been learning more about how when our gut flora isn't very diverse, we get sick. And it's very much the same thing with the stream. If they don't have all these critters, it just doesn't have what it needs to be a healthy functioning system. And so she realized that this urban stream syndrome had scoured away all of this soft material at the bottom where the hyperreic zone exists. Um, and so she thought to do something that, as far as I can tell, is a first in the world experiment to rebuild a missing hyperreic zone and also repopulate it with these little critters. So that's her in the front. Um, and like I said, they did their historical ecology research. And the reason these areas were flooding again and again is because they were historical floodplains. And so by doing just two short sections of the creek that totaled only 1,600 feet in this 11 mile long creek, they really had an outsized impact on flooding. It hasn't flooded since they did the project. Um, it was, the hyperrea component was pretty inexpensive. It was like $300,000 in an $11 million project. But in order to convince city managers that even this $300,000 was worth spending, she got um, some scientists from the local university on board to do some studies to track how well certain things had worked because they expected that this was going to be um, replicated. And it already has been replicated across the city and the state. And they've gotten a lot of interest um, nationally and internationally as well. Um, so one was physical. You know, was water moving down into the hyperreic zone in the way that they had tried to design it with the things that they had placed in it? And they found that, yes, water was moving down in there 89 times the rate before the project, which isn't all that surprising because the hyperreic zone was basically non-existent before the project. Um, the biological component, you know, ecologists generally have this attitude of, like, if we build it, they will come. But um, as one of the people working on this project, project told me, you know, when your headwaters are a Home Depot parking lot, they're not coming. 
And so what they did was another novel experiment, which was to inoculate the hyperreak zone with critters. So they went to a nearby stream that was kind of comparable, but wilder. They put in their little gathering thing into the mud and uh, allowed the critters to come on board and then inserted them into the hyperreak zone here. And uh, so not all of them made it, uh, but it was successful. Um, they have seven times more crustaceans, worms, insects, and much greater species diversity than in the non-restored areas. It's sort of like a, a fecal transplant to sort of continue that gut analogy. Um, and so then the last thing they wanted to find out was, um, is the hyperreic zone helping with urban pollution? So with our big paved areas where we have these big floods and all of it runs off immediately, it's gathering a ton of things like lawn fertilizer and brake pad dust. And so first they measured how many chemicals were in the stream right after a storm and they found 1,900, which is typical. Um, and then they did this study also as a first in the world. They tried to figure out uh, you know, how to quantify a packet of water and then track its path through a certain stretch of the hyperreic zone. And they found that spending about three hours in a 15-foot stretch of the hyperreic zone reduced 78% of the chemicals by at least half. So there are other markers of success. The city hasn't flooded since they did the project. It's an amazing park. The neighbors love it. They have educational stuff there for kids. Um, the stream flow is more consistent year round because it's supplied by the groundwater. Um, the temperature as well. Uh, they've saved money because typically in an urban stream along with all that pollution is a lot of really fine dust that they have to dredge regularly. Um, but in fact, they used to have to dredge around here about once a year. Now it's about once every five years. And that's because the natural system is redistributing that sediment and using it for itself. And then in the ultimate marker of success, Chinook salmon actually returned and spawned in the hyperreak zone that they had built. So what I take away from this story is that these systems are incredibly complex. They're very difficult to restore when we damage them. But if we don't understand them, we're not going to have much hope of restoring them. So um, generally, the message of the book is that if we let go of our impulse for control and instead collaborate with water, make and hold space for it within our human habitats, um, things are going to go a lot better for us. And just another thought, you know, the single focus problem solving that we have also extends to our economic policy, right? Like if we're considering whether to build a levy to prevent a flood, the cost of the levy is weighed against the protection for that one community. But we're not counting against that all of the damage to these natural systems that are supporting us in many other ways. We're not counting the damage to another community. Um, and nor are we counting all the many, many benefits from a nature-based solution that is going to provide carbon storage and um, biodiverse life and recreation for people and solving both flooding and drought at the same time. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is like how, how are we making these decisions about our land use? Um, this is my website if you want to learn more. And in general, what I took away from the people I met is that you know climate change and these water extremes are really overwhelming. And I think people can feel like it's out of control and there's nothing we can do. We're waiting for international leaders to do something. But these slow water projects, because they're distributed, because they're unique to every community, they're really empowering. You know, People come together with other people in their communities and do something in their own area to protect their community from flood and drought. And there are really important uh, wider climate benefits from the carbon storage and wetlands to the kinds of forest eco-climate teleconnections that I was talking about. So this is an invitation to get curious about water and ask, what does water want? Thank you. Very much. I'm sure there are lots of questions for you from the crowd. So um, if anyone who has a question can just raise their hand, I'll point my mic at you. And um, yes. Uh, you referred to uh, 
a study of 1,500 fires. Could you tell us what the study is? Um, no. <laughs> I don't have the uh, citation right at my fingertips, okay. but if you follow up with me afterward, I can send it to you. A quick follow-up question. Um, 30 years ago, the uh, water commission that supplies our drinking water was clear-cutting our watershed. Uh, that was stopped. For 30 years, there's been no logging. And this year, they're starting up logging again, and this time, the rationale is to decrease fire load. Have you got any comments about that? Yeah, I mean, that is basically what that study you mentioned is undermining. And there's a, a growing body of science that's showing that that is not accurate. And, you know, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't know, but I, I kind of wonder where the funding comes from, that the studies that suggest, you know, I think it's another example of that kind of single focus problem solving, you know, like we did have a, a habit of squashing fires and not allowing things to burn, but you know that was often within a system, um, you know that was being commercially logged. So I think, yeah, I, it is very much a dominant narrative that we need to clear the forests, we need to clean them, but um, that is not what some of the emerging research says. I can answer your question where the funding is coming from. They've decided not to do any more thinning or logging or removing any material other than the profits they can make from doing that work. So that's yes. how they that's how they plan it, plan to fund it. Hmm. Thank so, you. Just to answer that question. question. Yes. Well, I, I'm wondering if any studies have been done to uh, determine the amount of methane compared with the body and the type of flow of the water through a beaker dam and the volumes of the water compared with that with man-made dams, uh, you know, from the decomposing uh, vegetation and so on. Um, I'm just wondering if it's proportional to the size of the dam or if there is something else in the nature of a beaver dam construction or the amount of water taken out for human use that doesn't get through the floodgates of a man-made dam? That's a good question. I'm not aware of any um, direct beaver to human dam comparisons on methane. Um, there may be, and now maybe I'll go look for it. <laughs> I like that question. Um, I do know that um, you know, human dams, they have a lot of embedded emissions in the concrete. Uh, in some places, it can take, you know, 10 to 15 years of fossil fuel operation to offset that concrete footprint. Um, and then there also is the, the methane emissions. Um, humans run dams for their own, on, on their own schedule for electricity generation or for water availability which is different than the scale or the timing at which a, a natural system would have water or release water. Um, so I know that is a factor as well, but I don't have the exact answer to your question. Other questions? How long did it take for that change to happen in that last example that you gave? Um, it was pretty quick after they did the work. Um, the, it hasn't flooded since they completed it. Um, and I mean, it took a while for the plants to become as full as they are. But that photo that you saw at the end was right at the end of the project. Um, so it's much, much more lush today. They finished it, I think, in 2015. Um, and they've done a bunch more similar projects since. Uh, but it was a, a functioning system right away. They did the, the studies shortly after completion and they're, they're doing additional studies. Like um, one researcher who looked at the chemical pollution stuff, he's trying to figure out how much water typically goes through the hyperreak zone in a natural system, um, you know, and how much is just like flowing down the stream on top. Does it go down and come back up? So there's a lot we still don't know about that. <clears throat> yes, I'm not from British Columbia, but I've worked on water issues in Canada. 
in, mm -hmm. and on the prairies, Saskatchewan, the uh, you have a, a smaller population. It's easier to know the players and the factors in the province that are driving various agendas. There's a huge influence on our knowledge base on the university that comes through corporate interests. They fund the political parties. The government isn't supposed to influence the research that gets done at the university, but it does so in a, a very obscene way. In my view, and in being in, having been involved with those uh, things and efforts of citizens to get the uh, a balance and, and to get things corrected so that young people are being uh, taught to be curious and to be dis uh, discovering new things rather than uh, uh, reiterating the views of the older people at the university, not all of them, but some of them, it's just a, it seems to be a losing battle. And I wonder what your view is as a researcher. It, to me, you've got wonderful work that can be very productive, it can be very inspiring, it can uh, you know, cause people to get involved in helping to solve the problems. But then you have this counterbalance, and I would say overbalance, of these forces and, that are so heavily loaded with money that it's extremely difficult to rescue that knowledge base, that community need to be involved if we're going to straighten some of this out. So what's your, it's very frustrating for me. How's it for you? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a problem everywhere in the world. Um, and I think also the kind of single focus problem solving is is inherent in the, the wider culture, which leads to um, kind of making the same mistakes again and again. Um, but. You know, I've been following this movement for more than 15 years. It's gaining momentum around the world. Um, it's still a little bit on the fringe, but I'm hearing more discussion of it in the mainstream. Um, you know, sometimes when things go mainstream, they become co-opted and then they aren't done in, in the way that is actually affected. So that's a potential issue. But I think, you know, we are having these increasingly frequent disasters and so I think it is pushing people and you know the the climate conversation has shifted where people realize we need to change fundamental things about how we do things so I, I do see momentum and also you know one of the best ways for ideas to spread is when somebody sees somebody else near them having success with something so like in Kenya for example I didn't go into the Kenya story, but one thing that these smallholder farmers are doing are building these small ponds to collect rainwater, and that reduces erosion, it allows them to grow more crops, um, it uh, protects the water from sediment, it, it, there's various aspects to it. But it's incredibly popular in this region because one farmer sees their neighbor do it, and then they want to do it, and then the next guy wants to do it. And I saw that in, in many areas. And the examples in my book, I really tried to focus on places that were taking it to scale on some level, so at the national or, or state level. And, you know, it's still early days in those efforts, but there are national policies in some places um, that are encouraging this kind of thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, my main goal in writing the book was to open up the conversation and have people think more in depth about how water actually works um, and to share, try to expand the audience for the stories of people who are having significant successes with it. Uh, we have time for what, one or two more questions. I'll take uh, the two of you over there. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you have opportunities to communicate your work to the levels of government that really need to hear this message. 
Yeah, um, I've been really um, fortunate to have a lot of speaking invitations. I've been traveling and then also doing some online. Um, I've spoken at the UN Water Conference in New York. I've spoken to the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. Um, I've spoken to state governments and um, a lot of community and city groups who manage water, floodplain managers, um, utilities, uh, water scientists and engineers. I've been actually a little surprised at how um, interested people seem to be and how open they are. Um, and then also to various NGOs and community groups and um, you know lay people as well. Um, some, yeah. Um, like I went to Maine Island to speak. Um, I was invited to speak to a group in Machosan. Uh, there's this opportunity right here. Yeah. Come on up to the Cook's Island. I'd love to. Is there a way that the people from the communities, that you visit, the communities for whom water is an integral part of that community, is there a way that those people talk about water that differs from the way we talk about? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, so um, in Peru, Peru has a, a water scarcity problem. Um, most of the population lives on the desert. Most of their water comes from the mountains. The glaciers are melting. And there are farmers up there um, who have this 1,400-year-old method of extending the water from the rainy season into the dry season. And basically, they root it out of streams when it's flowing heavy and into these natural infiltration basins so that it moves underground much more slowly. And then they can pull it out um, for a longer period of time. And now the cities down below are tapping into that as well. But one of the farmers told me, if we plant the water, we can harvest the water. Mm -hmm. And I love that because it shows that thought of caretaking. You know, it's not just something we can grab. Like, we have to be thoughtful about it. We have to think about what it's doing. We have to make the most of it. Similarly, in Kenya, um, they have a National Water Towers um, Conservation Association. And the idea is that, uh, you know, there are a lot of really tall mountains in Kenya, which is the source of almost all the water for the people who live below. And so there's this acknowledgment that the government needs to ensure that supply is protected for everyone. Um, and then there are different levels, right? You've got like the national parks at the top and then the working forest lands and then the agricultural lands and on down to the cities. And there people would talk about the people up above as water producers and the people below as water consumers. Um, so it really made uh, clear that connection, right? That it's all part of a system and that um, the people down below who are benefiting from the water um, then would invest in some of the things that people above were doing, acknowledging that they were kind of caretaking their water as it moved down down the mountain. Maybe, uh, maybe one more. Um, I'm from the Gulf Islands, <laughs> not Mean Island, but Gulf Islands. Um, one of the solutions that seems to be um, proposed to enable even more development in the Gulf Islands is that if everybody has cisterns and tanks to capture rainwater, um, even if the um, aquifer, which is declining significantly, were depleted, you know, everybody could rely on that water. Climate change is, of course, um, extending the drug. Yeah, um, 
I am not an expert in the geology of Galliano Island, um, but you know you can store water in your own area for the greater good through a rain garden or um, like a, an intrusion well. So like the water goes into the well and then it moves into the ground through the sides. Um, and so that's one way that people kind of encourage the local infiltration of water and in, into the local system without having that really direct, you know, I capture my water and it's mine. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of opportunities for saving water, um, like getting rid of lawns, for example, um, ensuring the return of native plants on your land that don't need supplemental water. Um, so, and like I said, the, the socio-hydrology field has shown again and again that when you bring more water supply, you just increase demand. So, uh, you know, what is the carrying capacity of a Gulf Island? Do you want or need um, ongoing growth? Is, is that desirable? I mean, I think those are important questions for any, for any area, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do, I do think if everybody is capturing all their rainwater, I guess it depends on how big of an area they're, they're fielding from. If it's just what's running off their house, you know, maybe that's a reasonable amount <laughs> to conserve. I, I don't know the exact answer to that, but um, you're right that the water has a role in the wider system, and so that's something to consider for sure. Okay, there's a few more questions. <laughs> yes. For renting, I, I just have a quick answer to the methane question, which is that <clears throat> methane is produced by reservoirs because the organic matter is very deep where there's no oxygen. And the bacteria that live down there convert into methane. Whereas the methane that's increasing from wetlands today is because wetlands are drying up. And the things like logs that are in the water. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually think we are out of time. Um, I just want to say before we thank Erica that her book is for sale. You, the bookstore has kindly got it here. Um, those of you who are sitting at the back, if you don't mind bringing your chair outside to let people pass through, we appreciate all the young people who brought in chairs and, and attended today. And. Um, uh, just thank you so much, Erica. It was really fascinating. And, and thank she'll you be here for, for a few me. minutes to answer your personal questions as well. So thank you. Thank you. Very much.